Well, hey, everyone. I want to welcome you to worship today. My name is Jerry. I serve here as one of your pastors. And whether you're joining us online or in person today, uh, welcome to week five of the God With Us series. And I love um, what we've been kind of tackling through this whole series, dealing with, uh, you know, the God who in Christ entered this world 2,000 years ago. Uh, He does not desire to be a hashtag in your life. He desires to be intimately involved in every area of our lives. So we've been talking about God with us in our workplace, in our marriages, in our family. Last week, great message by Pastor Ryan on God with us in our digital world. And today we're going to talk about God with us in our pain. God with us in our pain. You know, as I was listening uh, to Sarah, Sarah's story and remember what they went through during all those uh, days, I think one of the things that stood out to me from her message was that um, <clears throat> in the middle of that time, in the middle of the struggle with all the questions that she had, that she said, at, at one point I realized I needed to invite God into my pain into my pain, and that somehow the voice of God would be louder than the voice of the enemy. And um, that's really what I want us to focus on today, is about it is entirely possible to be in love with Jesus and yet at the same time feel that your heart is breaking or that you have questions or that you're struggling or that you're in pain. And what does that mean to live that journey out with Jesus and to know the hope that we find in him while still experiencing the pain of this fallen world. So let's pray and then we'll get started. Lord Jesus, thank you. We thank you for the gift of Christmas. We thank you for the gift that that you entered this world on a rescue mission that you did not turn away from the pain and the suffering of this broken world. That you lived this sinless life and yet you experienced the brokenness and the pain that we experience in this common journey. And yet God, in all of it, the story of Christmas is a story of a God who is with us even in the mess. God, would you fill our hearts with hope with courage to live in this hour, even in the midst of our pain and our questions and our brokenness. In Jesus' name, amen. So um, pain is a common journey we all face, that we all take together. This is not just unique to Sarah and Wes. It is a common journey that we all take as human beings. I think if you have gone through the last two years and you would not be able to acknowledge today that you've experienced any pain or questions or struggles, then you have to be living in complete denial of reality. Because if there's anything more clear to us is that the last two years, even though we know that struggles and pain are a part of living out life, The truth is, these last two years, it's almost like there's been an intensity created. Some of you, your marriages didn't make it through COVID. You were kind of hanging on by a a little thin thread, and yet COVID just kind of pushed you over the top. Maybe you were on the edge of recovery, and now you're kind of back into a full-blown addiction. Maybe you've lost a loved one during this season. I can't think of many people that have probably not lost someone during this difficult time. And maybe even during that that loss, you are not able to even be with them as they lived out their final days. And the reality of someone not being at the table this Christmas is a reality for your life. I remember hearing the first year of covid that there was a local intake facility, a mental health facility for children and adolescents. The intake population on that mental health facility went up 
100% during the first year of COVID. So this is a reality that all of us have been living with. <clears throat> and I, I think it's a little bit humorous that, that God would kind of, um, you know, all of us experience pain, but really over the last couple of months, there's been, you know, just some things that have been going on that, you know, have, have created kind of just a little more intensity of stress and, and anguish, I know, even in my life. And I generally am a pretty you know, go get it, happy, go lucky kind of guy. But uh, the last couple of months have not been easy. And then on top of it, <clears throat> about six months ago, I uh, hurt my right shoulder working out. Just it, not bad, just a little bit of a strain. And then like two weeks ago, I woke up with um, lower back pain and sciatica all down the right side of my leg, numbness, tingling, and, uh, you know, I don't remember anything that happened. It's just, I guess I'm 61. Those kind of things happen. You just wake up with it. And uh, so I've been going to see someone for that. And then literally, y'all, no joke, like last Monday, I'm making macaroni and cheese for my granddaughter Aspen. And I turn in the kitchen and I just turn a little awkwardly on my knee and I felt something kind of pop. It's all on my right side. I was telling someone the other day, if I could just cut off the right side of my body, I would be fine. But, but I just thought it was kind of interesting that as I'm preparing for this talk about pain, you know, it's almost like, you know, I'm not just preaching to you. This is about all of us. And so what I wanted to do, <clears throat> um, because I think, when we come to Christmas, there's this kind of feeling that everything's supposed to be perfect. You know, I got to have the best lights on my house. You know, I got to buy the best presents for everybody. You know, and, and, and you, you know, you watch Hallmark movies where everything works out at the end. And, and, you know, we sing songs like Silent Night, all is calm, all is bright, sleep in heavenly peace. And you're like, my life is far from peace. Far from calm. I don't know who they're singing about in those songs because it's certainly not about my life. And there's something about the, the kind of this perfect kind of picture we have of Christmas that, that makes us, makes all the more reason why some of our suffering and pain feels more intensified. It feels like it's under the microscope and like it's, there's, a, there's a, a picture of it that we experience sometimes in Christmas greater than any other time of the year. And sometimes if we're honest, we, we might stop and look at the Christmas story and say, I don't see anything in shepherds and wise men in this beautiful little nativity scene that, that in any way, shape, or form connects with my pain. You may not be aware of the fact that there is a whole portion of to the birth narrative that, that is actually included in the birth narrative. Because in the Gospels, you get like the first few years of Jesus' life and then fast forward to about 30 years, 30, 30 years of age. And nothing in between. And so it's kind of included in the birth narrative um, of Jesus. This last portion that you'll never find on a Christmas card anywhere. And, and you probably have rarely heard it preached on. But I think it perfectly points us towards what we want to talk about today. It's found in Matthew chapter 2. Now let me give you the context of this. The shepherds have gone. The wise men have come and brought their gifts. And then they have left. As where our passage picks up today. And uh, the context of it is that the wise men stop and ask for directions to try to find the king of the Jews. The only problem is that they stopped by the palace of the guy who was known as the king of the Jews to ask for directions. And it was probably like a social faux pas. They didn't know who they were talking to. And all of a sudden they're saying, we're looking for the king of the Jews. They don't realize the guy they're talking to is an insanely paranoid king who thinks everybody is out to steal the crown. History says that he only stood about four feet tall, and every building he built was big, almost as if he was compensating 
for his size. But he was insanely jealous and paranoid. In fact, it said that he killed, he had one of his wives executed. Not like divorced her, executed her, and several of his sons. In fact, there was a saying that it was more safe to be Herod's pig than to be one of his sons. And this is the guy that the magi, the wise men, are talking to, looking for the king of the Jews. And so they're warned in a dream after giving the gifts to Jesus and worshiping him that um, they're warned in a dream to leave by another way, which of course ticks Herod off immensely that he's not going to find the location of this child they're talking about. So we pick up in verse 13 of chapter 2 in the Gospel of Matthew. Here's what it says. When they, meaning the wise men, had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and the mother during the night, and they left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I've called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they were no more. Merry Christmas, by the way. Right? I mean, that's not exactly what you want to lean into. We want to lean into more of that beautiful picture of Christmas. And yet this, my friends, is reality. You see, Joseph doesn't get to go back home to the nursery and all of his loved ones and and get his income going again. In the middle of the night, he's running for his life with his wife and their baby. And they're going to become refugees in Egypt. And I love Matthew's picture of this Old Testament passage from Jeremiah where he talks about Rachel weeping for her children. This is a passage that comes from Jeremiah, and, and, and Matthew's known as, as the, the, the gospel where he always wants to bring the Old Testament into the New Testament. And so he's, he's capturing a passage in Jeremiah. Uh, it's said in history that many of the, the exiles, when, when Babylon came, when Babylonians came in and defeated uh, and ransacked Jerusalem, that, that from Ramah, uh, that's where they deported a lot of the Jewish men to take them off into exile. And literally in Jeremiah, he's he's referring to Rachel, who was one of the matriarchs of the Hebrew people who had died on the road giving giving birth to a child. And uh, he's, he's calling to this kind of haunting picture of a dead matriarch weeping in her grave for the calamity that had fallen upon their Jewish men as they were being taken into exile. And Matthew dials up this picture to say, this is Rachel again weeping in Ramah for her children that were no more. You see, Jesus' whole beginning on earth was not filled with palaces and security guards and luxury. He was a refugee. His whole beginning was surrounded by pain and loss. And when you fast forward later into the public ministry of Jesus, you see much of the same thing. You know, sometimes we get this picture of Jesus who's just kind of floating around and everything's great. And yet, if you look at it, you know, Jesus was constantly moving toward the pain and the agony of this world. He constantly was moving towards the marginalized and the hurting and the broken. Over and over again, where where people were given a way out, Jesus went in. It even says at one time that he weeps 
at the tomb of one of his friends who have died. And I know a lot of pastors who just try to preach all around that passage to kind of make Jesus into, you know, something that, that you know, that he was, oh, he was just weeping because he's angry at the situation. And I get all that. But where did we ever leave the idea that Jesus is fully human, couldn't weep? And then if you look further, I mean, Jesus experienced betrayal, rejection. He was misunderstood even by his own family. He experienced loneliness. And all the Bible says without sin. In the garden before Jesus went to the cross, when he agonized over what was ahead of him, The Gospel of Luke records that that Jesus, as he was agonizing over where he was getting ready to go, and and he was praying to the Father, if at all possible, let this cup, meaning the cup of suffering, pass from me. It says that um, in that moment, Jesus sweat drops of blood. To which we say, how is that even possible? And there was actually a condition, something like hemodrosis, which is a condition in which the capillary blood vessels that feed the sweat glands rupture, causing them to exude blood, occurring under conditions of extreme physical or emotional stress. And then what about Jesus and his death experience? Excruciating pain of flogging, being nailed to a cross, naked before everyone, left to die, From suffocation. Isaiah prophesied the Messiah who would come 700 years before Jesus was born. In Isaiah 53, 3 and 4, it says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Familiar with pain. Verse 4 Surely he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Andy Stanley says this, we as Christians believe that the worst possible thing happened to the best possible person. And in Hebrews, it says that we have a high priest who is familiar with our struggles. Therefore, let us approach the throne of God's grace with confidence. Confidence. Jesus, all that, just to set up this, Jesus, the Son of God, was not exempt from suffering and intentionally entered into suffering for your healing and for mine and for our redemption. And so out of that, I want to just leave you with three basic Truths that I believe to the depth of my heart that are a part of how Jesus impacts our suffering and our pain. First of all, because God is bigger than any struggle that I face, it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay. We live in a cultural world of okayness. You know that. You come to church. I'm okay, you put on your game face. It's like you got it all together because what if people understood you didn't have it all together? It'd be like, would they think any less of me? Would they think that I'm not as strong a Christian? You know, I'd feel shame, I might feel embarrassed. And we kind of live in this world where we want to do behavior management and somehow make all of the rest of the world believe that we're okay, that we got it all together, and yet behind the smiles, behind all the laughter, as you come and gather here in this place, there's hurt and there's pain all over this auditorium and everywhere online. But we've learned how to dance around that, to pretend as if somehow... You know, it's not okay to not be okay. I love what uh, Sheila Walsh writes in one of her books called It's Okay to Not Be Okay. She writes this, The Bible is not a Pinterest app 
of happy thoughts and motivational quotes. It is full of the honest, heartbroken cries of those who loved God but felt the painful slam of the door in their face. And we see it all through Scripture. It's not like this perfect world where everybody has everything together. King David, the man after God's own heart, wrote these words in Psalm 6. I am worn out from my groaning. All night long I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of my foes. Paul, the greatest missionary, one of the greatest missionaries who ever lived, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, wrote this to the people as he was going through his missionary journeys. He said, I don't want you to be uninformed about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. He starts by saying, I know you think I've got courage, that I'm bold, that we're reaching people all over the known world. But I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to think it's all roses and butterflies and rainbows. I don't want you to be uninformed of all the troubles we have experienced in Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. The the translation of the Greek there is that we were ready to give up hope. That's how painful it was. And I know we say this all the time, and I don't know where I got this from, but it's not my original quote, so I don't think it's from me. But, but, you know, we're not called to be a museum of perfect people. We are a hospital of sinners saved by grace. You see, we're not, our lives are not defined by being the perfect parents and being the perfect people to have it all together and all right. The story of the good news of our lives is we have a perfect Savior who has entered into our mess and who has made a way for us to find healing, to move towards hope. But it begins when we acknowledge, I'm not okay. I'm not okay. I desperately need what only God can give me. Sheila Walsh in in her book, Um, And I don't know, some of you young people may not know Sheila Walsh, but um, by all intensive purposes, she was a picture of success. She was married. She had kids. uh, She was a well-known singer. She was a TV show host. She was known around the world for her faith. And she came to this place where she hit a brick wall in her life. She came to this place where she realized she wasn't okay. She was suffering from depression and anxiety. And for years, she said, I just tried to become this like spin doctor who tried to spin everything and make everybody believe everything's all right and everything's okay and I've got the answers and and God is good and I'm good and everything's good. But inevitably, she came to this wall that she hit where she realized I'm not okay. And she said, in that place of my brokenness, God's grace met me there. And years afterwards, when she was, you know, she's in recovery and she's been making steps by by the Holy Spirit's power to, to have her life transformed, but she's still dealing with some of this stuff. She's on this radio talk show and she writes in her book that she was acknowledging her struggles with depression. And there was a caller that was calling in to ask her questions. And the woman said to her, so so you did actually go into a mental health facility? And she said, yes. And she said, you're actually still taking medication? And Sheila said, yes. And the woman caller said, well, I'm very disappointed in you. To which Sheila said, I told her as kindly as I could that there was far more about me that would disappoint her. 
But the one thing that I was crystal clear about that morning on that talk show, I'm not the good news. Jesus is. He's the hero of the story, not me. That's why we just sang that song, Worthy is the Lamb. That comes from Revelation 5 where, where all of heaven is searched for. Who's going to open up the book of life? And, and John is having this vision. He's like so worried and he's weeping because no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth is worthy to open the book of life. And then it said, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb, he is worthy to open the book of life. Worthy is the Lamb. It's okay to not be okay. I hope that we are always a church that acknowledges we are saved by the grace of God, not because of our good works and not because we have it all together. We are on a journey towards sanctification together by the help of Jesus. But I hope we're always a safe landing place where broken and hurting people and people that are struggling can actually acknowledge it And find a safe place of grace here in this church from which to begin a journey towards healing and wholeness. The second thing I think how Jesus impacts our lives is that God never promises us the absence of pain in our lives. He promises to walk with us through it. He promises to walk with us through it. Jesus himself didn't exempt himself from suffering and pain. And so just because you might say today, well, I'm a Christian, and I know sometimes some of you may be signed up for the whole Christian thing, thinking somebody sold you a bill of goods, and they say, oh, everything's great. It's going to be wonderful. There's not going to be any problems or struggles. And you kind of bought into that, and then you're like, man, what happened? Jesus never promised that. In fact, if you look at John 16, 33, I want to begin later in the passage because I think usually this is only quoted from here. Jesus said to his disciples as he was getting ready to go to the cross and he wanted to set them up for for life that was going to grow chaotic and, and messy after he was crucified. And a lot of people start the quote here. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so Jesus acknowledges, you will have trouble in this world. He wanted them to know that. That's embracing reality. We live in a fallen world. We are between, you know, this perfect world that God created because of our decisions, because of our sin. This world is kind of like plan B. But Jesus came into this plan B in order to redeem this world. And to put us on a course to where one day there would be a new heaven and a new earth. And there would be no more crying and no more pain or suffering or death or mental illness or addiction or depression. There would be no more. But God, that there would be none of that. But in the meantime, we live in the in-between. Here's what Jesus started that passage with. I told you these things so that in me, in me, you would have peace. Not in your circumstances, not in your struggles. In me, you will have peace. Because in this world, you will have troubles. But take heart. Another translation of that is take courage. Because I have overcome the world. Not because you will overcome the world, but because Jesus has overcome the world. That's why Paul could write in Romans, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us one day. See, God promises to walk with us through the storm. That's why in the book of Psalms, we're reminded that The good shepherd walks with us even in the valley of the shadow of death. That's why also in the Psalms we we read that God is close to the brokenhearted. Those who are crushed in spirit. 
the third thing that I think is so important to remember. It's, it's really a quote. I, I've been quoting this all along, not knowing where it came from. It's from Charles Spurgeon. And the quote says, when you can't see God's hand, trust his heart. When you can't see his hand, trust his heart. See, here's the truth. On this side of eternity, there are questions uh, about suffering and pain that I don't think we'll ever have answered. And the truth is, um, maybe that's where you are right now. And I know for some of you maybe listening here today, uh, you may not even be a Christ follower, and maybe this has been kind of the sticking point for you. Because of this problem of pain and suffering in the world. And we come to this place, and, and um, the truth is, some of us are in a place where we, we just don't know how to make sense of it all. And, and some of what you're going through, you know, I'm talking about, you know, pastor, it's easy to talk about a little back pain. You, I've had back pain all my life. Or, or, or maybe, you know, you're struggling with, with your marriage is falling apart. Or maybe you've been diagnosed with a terminal illness. Or maybe you're struggling with a mental illness. And, and so it gets way more complicated maybe for you. And I can't give you all the answers, but all I can do is the same thing for you that I do for myself, and that is to point us to the only hope we have, and that's in Jesus. And the heart of God has displayed all through scripture while we don't have understanding of all about why some of the things happen in life we know this has been made clear in scripture that God is for you and not against you the Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us in this while we were yet sinners while we were still in the middle of our mess Christ died us God is for us and I'll tell you there have been times in my life where that was the only anchor I had Christ in you the hope of glory Christ in you he is the only one worthy you know yesterday we celebrated the life of a great man named Tim DeLaSantis. We happened to share some time in life group together, and uh, most of you don't even know Tim's story, but um, Tim's wife, uh, Rowena, was diagnosed um, about five or six years or more ago with a very rare disease that, that is like Parkinson's on steroids and it's terminal and it's totally incapacitating and while you might have never known Tim you might have known his daughter Rachel who was one of our interns last year and she's now serving in our our student ministry on staff now but you look at Tim's life Tim gave up everything in his life. He gave up his career. He gave up anything that, that mattered to him because the two people that mattered most in life was his wife and his daughter. And when they went into this journey with this incurable disease, Tim lived out this picture of sacrificial love like very few I have ever seen in my lifetime. He was the picture of of the suffering servant of Jesus. I watched yesterday as we got ready for a service. There were like 10 people trying to help Rowena just to kind of be secure in her wheelchair. And I thought, Tim did that by himself for six plus years. Giving up a career, giving up any hope of ever having like the stuff of this world to pour his heart and soul into his wife and to give his daughter you know 
a high school experience that felt somewhat normal. This man was living in chaos and hurt and pain over six plus years, but you never heard him complain. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt how this man was able to walk out that journey when he could not see the hand of God. He trusted the heart of God for him, for his wife, and for his daughter. And he lived out this story of grace and love that was an inspiration. And he didn't have all the answers. And it didn't mean that just because he believed in God, everything would be fine. But he trusted the heart of God for him. And I could only hope and pray my life would be one-tenth of that kind of faith in God when life becomes a mess when I feel like I'm in the middle of the storm that he could be our strength and our hope and our anchor one of the reasons I love testimonies videos in our church because people just get raw and honest. This is how it was. I ain't going to pull any, you know, like notions that I had it all together. In fact, that's the very reason why I needed Jesus because in my life, I had struggles, I had challenges. So every time I see a testimony, my heart is just so encouraged because we're not pointing to look at me and look at how perfect my life is. We're pointing to Jesus and saying, Look at his life. Look at his life. So today we're going to take a few moments here at the end of the message to look at Doug's story. See how Jesus has begun a change in his life. And he's only at the beginning of that journey. But what an amazing God we serve who meets us in the middle of our mess and takes us on a journey of healing, 